Hi folks and welcome back to the channel and in this video we're going to be looking at welding equipment and its specifics. A lot of people have been watching my old rusty videos on YouTube and they wondered why I'm using a TIG, why I'm using a MIG or why I'm sometimes using an arc welder. And I am no professional welder whatsoever but I've been welding for quite a while and I've been working on cars for a long time. So we're going to be looking at the traditional arc welder or the stick welder. That's the one I have right here. Uh, it's a big beast. Uh, then we're going to be looking at the smaller one, which is also a traditional arc welder or a stick welder or an MMA. Uh, but to get away the TIG, we'll be looking at the MIG. We'll be looking at all these different things. And then we'll start looking at the different technologies used. MOSFET, IGBT technology, all those different things. So you can make up your mind what is the best piece of kit for you. The very basic welder is what we call an MMA welder, which is a manual metal arc welder. And this is one of them. And this is a very old fashioned transformer based arc welder. Very few controls on it, power on and off, and a regulator to adjust the amount of power that you need to weld. The method on these systems is very simple. You got a handle, and this is the handle, which is connected with the cable to the front of one of the jackets there. And then you have another face or polarity, which is then connected to the second socket, which is your clamp. And the clamp is gonna be clamped to your piece of metal that you want to weld. And in this handle, you have to put in electrode. And this is the electrode. And you just stick that in there. And then you can start welding. The first weld is a stick weld of two thick pieces of metal that we will weld back to back. And I'm using a 2.6 mil stick for that. So I'm going to set the arc welder or the MMA to about 80 amps. Typically 2.6 mil is good between 70 and 100. And let's see what it gives us. So now on the top you see the slack that's on it, so that you need to knock off. And that is the final weld. Basically. Now these electrodes, they're going to melt down. So these are consumables. So while you're causing an arc to jump between the surface of your object and the tip of the electrode, it's going to get shorter and shorter. Now you will see that around this stick, that's where the name stick welding is coming from, you will have kind of a coat. Uh, so the, the core is metal and you can get them in different types. This is normal steel, but I have one here which is for carbon. So this is a carbon based rod uh, or stick. So you can get different sticks for different purposes. Now the coat that's around the core is there to create protection and arc stability. So while you're welding, the arc will melt at the core and the core will cause some vapor um, and that vapor will surround the arc and will cause, of course, arc stability. So that's what this is about. Now, the sticks, they are coming in different sizes, different thicknesses, depending what you want to weld. Small piece, a thick piece, thin material, thick material. You have to select the proper thickness of the stick. Now, as well, on the top, you will have a dial indicator how much power you're generating. So there's a table on the side normally or on the top that tells you the size of the electrode versus the power you're going to need. So let us have a look inside on how this thing is really working. I already removed the screws, guys. So, so the first thing which is obvious is the big transformer. And for the rest, there is not much in it. The big transformer is fed by the mains plug, which is coming in through a front switch, and then the mains power, whatever you have to 20 or 110 volts, is fed to the primary of the transformer. And then the secondary, the output of the transformer, is then fed to the front of those connection points for your handle and your clamp, so you can start welding. So the transformer, what does it do? Well, the transformer is going to down transform the 220 volts or the 110 volts, depending on your mains, to a much lower voltage, maybe around 48 volts, 50 volts, something like that, but a lot higher amperage. 
And in the back here, you see a metal plate, and this is actually a diode stack. So the AC, which is coming out of your secondary winding of your transformer, the lower voltage that is, is then fed to a to diodes, will then rectify that AC to DC. So the output of this welder provides you both DC and AC. There is not a lot to it. There's an additional coil here on the top. A little, it looks almost like a transformer, but it's not. It is a coil to smoothen actually the uh, rectif rectification of the uh, AC into DC. And that's it, guys. There is nothing more to it. Now, the question now is, how do you adjust the power output on this one? Well, for that, you need to have a little bit of a closer look. You know already that in the front, we have a kind of a rotating arm that we can turn around. And if we want to increase the power, we turn it clockwise. If we want to decrease it, we turn it anti-clockwise. Now, of course, another welder might be different. Some have it in steps, but this is a continued adjustment. So you can do it in incremental steps continuously. And it's not with switches. Some of them have switches, so you jump in steps up or down in amperage. This one is continuous. The way they do this is a bit unique. So I don't know if you can see it. Hopefully you can. But over here, so this part right here is kind of an insert. And if I turn the controls for more or less power, you see how that is moving in? And it slides in a metal core inside the transformer. And because it's doing that, uh, it changes the magnetic field of the transformer. So it's going to reduce the efficiency of the transformer. So it reduces or increases the power. This is how this is done. Very simple, very straightforward. The only drawback on this kind of welding equipment is it's bulky and it's very heavy. On my right, I have the traditional MMA welder with the transformer. This is 160 amps. And on my left, I have a MMA 160 amps as well. Same power, but it's an inverter type. Complete different technology. A lot smaller, as you can see. It also is a tick at the same time, but forget about the tick part. So let's open it up and see what the difference is. And you can see immediately, it is a day and night difference. Here, you got only a transformer, mechanical moving parts, nothing much can go wrong. Here, it's all about electronics. This is an inverter type. Most of the kit that I have is now inverter based. I have ticks and mix, and they're all inverters because it saves a hell of a lot of weight and volume because it does not require big transformers like you have in the traditional transformer types. And you can see the transformer inside, how small that is in the inverter-based MMA. So now let's have a look on how an inverter type works, because inverters are used both for MIG and TIG and MMAs. I have represented in a logical diagram the functioning of an inverter. And it doesn't matter if it's an MMA or if it's a TIG or a MIG. This is how all inverters kind of work like. First of all, you got your mains input. It's alternating current, be it 220 or 110, 50 hertz or 60 hertz. That mains input is rectified by a diode bridge. And these diodes are generating DC current, direct current as the output. Now the direct current is now switched in a switching matrix, either built with MOSFETs or IGBT transistors. And the rate the switch is opening and closing is determined by your setting on the power you want to have on the output. And depending on the rate of this switch closing and opening, which we call, by the way, pulse width modulation, we'll have current flowing through the primary uh, winding of the transformer. Now, this is going to be high frequency. So we're not talking about 50 or 60 hertz, but we're talking about maybe 1000 hertz or maybe 10,000 hertz or even 100,000 hertz. So that depends a bit on the type of welding equipment, but it's high frequency switching. Now, we know that transformers are becoming far more efficient at higher frequencies. That's why this transformer in an inverter-based welder is a lot smaller than what you've seen in the traditional welder. If you've seen it just before, how big that transformer was in the old MMA arc welder compared to the newer inverter-based. And that's all about efficiency at high frequency of transformers. So now we can have a small transformer. Now the secondary winding of the transformer will pick up the pulses that are introducing the magnetic field in the transformer. 
and it will re rectify it to a DC voltage, again by a set of diodes. And then of course that DC voltage is now a lot lower, high current, and is now fed to the torch, and the other side is your ground connected to your working piece. So this is how that works. It's very simple. Now the big difference will come in in the switching system. This is the switching area. These are solid state devices, uh, kind of transistors if you want to call them that way. And there are two major families. There is what we call the MOSFET, metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. That's one type. And then you have the second type, which, which is the IGBT, isolated gate bipolar transistor. Two different types of semiconductors built for different purposes. The MOSFET is very good at very high frequencies, but not as good at high power. The IGBT semiconductor is really designed for high power switching. And this is really what you want on your welding kit. So if you go in for an inverter type of welding kit, try to go for IGBT. It is better, especially if you're gonna weld for long times and continuously, it's not gonna time out or crap out on you, which a MOSFET based inverter might do because if it's getting too warm, because it's drawing a lot of current, uh, it's gonna shut off uh, as a thermic protection. So, um, trying to find an IGBT inverter, uh, they are the better ones for continuous high power welding. Now, um, you might see sometimes commercials and ads where they say, this is a MOS inverter with IGBT technology. Well, don't believe that, that's nonsense. You can't have both in one machine. So, let's have a look if we can find some of those components on the real TIG. This is an inverter-based MMA, and you'll find the switching solid-state devices right here. That's those. And those are, in this case, IGBT devices. Uh, those are bipolar transistors for high power. And you can see they are like kind of paired up. And that those are the ones that are doing the switching. Those are the ones that are generating the pulse width modulation, which is then fed to the transformer. These are the transformers right there. A lot smaller than what you see in the traditional welder. And of course, there's a lot more electronics on that associated with this because this is actually an MMA and TIG weld. So folks, in MMA welding or stick welding, we have two types. We've got the traditional transformer type and then we've got the inverter type. Um, the difference is, of course, the weight and the volume, and of course, the adjustments that you can have on those. Uh, this being an all electronic device, you have far more adjustments than on a pure mechanical device, which is this bigger MMA with the transformer. Now, of course, the transformer based MMA with almost no electronics in it, there's very little that can go wrong with it, so they are very reliable, but they are very heavy. Now, can you use this to work on a vehicle? Well, my answer to that is not really. Uh, they are not really suitable for welding very thin panels. Um, I have never had a lot of success uh, with that. I tend to burn through the panels. I find it very hard to work with these devices. However, for steel constructions or heavy steel constructions, uh, this is great. I would use that, and especially if I'm building on a house or something like that, or really heavy constructions on a car, then I guess uh, this is very suitable to be used. Um, or even the MMA based inverter, it's suitable as well. Now, I don't use my MMA inverter. I always use my old one because I like uh, this one to be used because it's so simple. Uh, but of course, if you're of a different opinion and you believe that they are, those tools are very handy on a car as well, then I would really like to hear from you and maybe I can learn from you if you can let me know in the comments on how you use a MMA or stick welder to weld on a vehicle. Now I'm not talking about welding on big uh, structural beams on your car or your ladder chassis, which are like two, three millimeters thick. That's a different story, of course you can. But for normal body panels on a car, normal body work, I don't think these are suitable. The other drawback I found is that you cannot weld continuously as that um, electrode is gonna get smaller and smaller because the electrode is actually consumable. And here is the electrode. Uh, you will have to stop welding once it's been consumed almost to the end and then you have to change it out and then start all over again. Something that you don't have with a MIG uh, at all. 
You do have the same problem with the TIG because there you're also working with consumable electrodes. But we'll talk about MIG and TIG now in the next part of this video. Now let's talk about the TIG. And TIG stands for tungsten inert gas. I've got a TIG on my left here and I've got another TIG sitting on my right. And you can actually see the gas bottle sitting right here, but we'll talk about all this in a minute. So you can see immediately that there are a lot more pieces involved than in a normal MMA welder. What I have here is what we call a torch, and you're gonna need the torch for TIG welding. We also have a couple of cups around, and we'll talk about those. We've got filler rods, and I have tungsten electrodes. So let's have a little bit of a close-up and see on how all these things work. TIG welding is most likely the most difficult method for learning to weld, but once you master it, it's a great way of welding. And the way it works is very simple. You've got a cup, this is the cup, and I've got more cups sitting around here, different sizes. And then inside you have a tip, and this is the tungsten tip. Now you can open that up, and you can see then the actual tungsten. This is the tungsten rod, and they come in different types as well. You can get boxes of different types for different purposes. Now, the tungsten is your electrode, and it's not gonna melt down. So this is not a consumable at all. It's gonna stay like this, but it's gonna have some wear and tear on the tip. So you may have to sharpen the tip every so often, just like you sharp a pencil. That's very important. Now, power is applied from your TIG to the tungsten rod. You make sure it comes through to a certain amount of length and about three quarters of a centimeter is good. And then uh, you are basically ready to weld. However, uh, welding with this is a bit tricky. You will have to place it, and I'll start about the starting methods in a few minutes. You have to place it close to the subject. And while you're welding, there's going to be an arc jumping over from the tip of the tungsten to your material, your welding material. And it's going to create a puddle of molted metal. And you will have to move that either forward or backward, depending on how you want to work. And at the same time, you have to fill in metal with this filling rod. In other words, you're going to need to use your two hands to weld. And that's not all that easy. Um, with a MIG, you have your second hand free. But with a TIG, you've got to use your two hands. So once you got the puddle going, you can add the material. So the non-consumable electrode in the middle is tungsten, and that's where the T comes from in TIG. You also have a cup. Here is the cup. And I can take the cup off. And cups come in different sizes. And whatever cup you have, you can use a five, a six, whatever. And the whole purpose of the cup is to create a gas bubble around the area where you're welding. So while you're welding, gas will come out and it will create a cloud of gas around the arc. And the purpose of that gas is to create arc stability, but also to improve penetration into the metal. So depending on what kind of gas you're going to use, you're going to have more or less penetration and better or less best arcing. Now, we'll talk about the gas in a few minutes. So this is what the torch is about. Often you find the switch either on the handle or you have a pedal on the floor. There's many settings you can do on a lot of these TIG welders. It all depends what kind of a TIG welder you have. Some very expensive ones have lots of settings and others have very little settings. TIG welding is most likely the most difficult form of welding, but it is not an overcomable. Once you exercise a few times, you will get the swing of it, you will get the feel and touch of it, and then you will be able to place beautiful welds, even on very, very thin materials. I've seen people welding on coke cans. It's amazing, you can do all this. Now, the tungsten electrodes, they come in different sizes and different materials. Also, the filling material comes in different types, uh, and you will have to find out exactly what type you're gonna need for what kind of welding job, 
And of course, the cups are coming in different shapes as well, depending on the piece you're welding and depending on what you're welding. Anyhow, uh, the next thing we need to talk about is, of course, the gas you're going to need, because you're going to need gas. This is unavoidable. So you will have to go and rent a gas bottle or buy a gas bottle and get it filled. Now, gas comes in many different ways. And again, it depends on what you're going to weld. So let's have a look on a gas bottle and talk a little bit about the gas. Gas bottles come in different sizes, but the type of gas is important. Typically for TIG welding, you're going to go for 95% argon and 5% carbon dioxide. Now the argon in this bottle, that will assure you the arc consistency, the arc stability. And of course, the carbon dioxide will actually work into the depth of welding, so the penetration level. So if you're going to weld on aluminum, then you probably need to weld with 100% argon. But if you're going to weld on steel, then you use carbon dioxide mixed with argon. And I'm using a 95% argon type with 5% carbon dioxide. Now, once you've got the bottle and you have selected the right gas, you will have to have a pressure regulator because these bottles have a lot of pressure in it, as you can see. And I think mine typically goes up to about 200 kilograms, uh, but of course I've been using it. So this is the pressure regulator, but then you also have to have a volume regulator, how many liters of gas that you want to have to flow out of the cup. And again, it depends on what you're welding on how much power you're welding. So this is something you will have to set. Now, typically I'm running mine at around seven to 10 liters per minute. And that seems to be working just fine for me. So the output of the, the gas bottle is going to your TIG welder. This is a low end TIG welder and it provides me 200 amps of power. It's based on MOS FET technology. I would have preferred IGBT, but at the time it wasn't there. It only runs about 150 euros or 150 dollars. I can do arc welding and I can do TIG welding. So that's great. Do you remember we talked about the MMA? So this can also do MMA. I only have a few controls on it. I have my power control, which is between 10 amps and 200 amps, but it is a continuous adjustment, which is great. So if you're starting welding with a TIG, then you need to adjust this and figure out what is for you the best setting, depending on the thickness of the material, depending on what you're welding. And then, of course, I have another setting, which we call post gas. Uh, once you start welding, you're about to stop and you let the switch go. So the arc has stopped. Then uh, the gas will continue flowing for a few seconds uh, to let the metal cool down and to prevent oxidation of that specific weld, because the gas also prevents oxidation. Uh, on the front, there is not much else to be seen. Uh, you've got the connection of your torch. Here it is. And this is a removable one. Here is the switch, the toggle switch, but you can connect a paddle to that one. And that, of course, is your big clamp that you need to clamp onto the metal because you always need to you always need two polarities. Of course, you're going to need the plus to connect to your working piece. And then the negative is going to your torch. This unit has very limited features and I cannot start the arc without anything else than high frequency arc starting. There are basically three methods to start an arc. The first method is what we call HF starting or high frequency starting. In other words, um, you will bring down the torch to the surface, but don't touch the surface with the electrode and then push the button and then an arc will be started. And the starting of the arc is high frequency that really helps the arc to be formed. Once the arc is in place, the high frequency will actually disappear and now you can start doing your welding by moving the torch left or right, depending on how you want to do it and adding material to it. Of course, you can only use this method if your welder is using high frequency arc start. And mine does that. So I have no other options. Some TIG welders have the option to use the second method, which is the touch and lift method. Touch and lift method is a bit different. You bring down the torch swiftly and you touch very gently the surface and then you lift it. And that should start the arc. The way this works is that the TIG welder will reduce the power to almost nil the moment the tip is touching the material. And thereby 
it does not spoil the tip of your tungsten electrode because that's not something you want. If the tip is spoiled with material, you have to clean it up and sharpen it again. So that's the touch and lift method. And the third method is what we call the scratch method. Probably the oldest method that I know of. And it's basically scratching gently the material until you have the arc and lift. Scratch and lift, scratch and lift. That method is not as good because it will actually pollute the tip of your uh, electrode. It is by far the most difficult method for welding. If you're a novice, it's going to be a bit tricky. You will have to play with it, try it out, but you will succeed at the end. It's a bit of exercise because you have to have the proper eye-hand coordination, as I call it, because you have to create the arc, move the torch around and keep filling material to that puddle. And that might be a little bit difficult sometimes. So this is what you need to do with TIG welding. You also will have to adjust the cup, select the right cup for the right job. Um, for instance, if you're going to weld outside and it's very windy, it's not going to work too well with a TIG. Uh, the gas will blow away. At least that's what I have experienced. Um, don't bring magnets close to the um, tip uh, once you start welding. You know, these holding magnets, if you do that, it's going to distort the arc in the beginning, especially with the high frequency start. All little things. So it, you really have to try it out. And, and But once you master it, you can create beautiful welds on very thin material. For the rest, I can say not much more. Uh, make sure you have the right gas mix. And 95% argon and 5% carbon dioxide typically works well for steel and most metals. Uh, I'm not saying for aluminum, of course, that's different. And have a look what you want to weld with your TIG. And then based on that, select the proper one. Remember that I mentioned on this one, I only have high frequency start. So be careful if you work on modern cars with this, uh, because it could destroy the electronics or it could have an influence on it. Of course, the cars I work on, like old trusty, I have no issue. There is no electronics in it. Anyhow, um, so much for the TIG. Um, so now let's move on to the MIG, which I found a far better system to weld with. It's a lot faster than TIG. Of course, it doesn't create those beautiful uh, artisan welds like you can do with a TIG, but as I am a novice in welding, my MIG is probably better than my TIG welds. So now let's talk a bit about MIG welding. And MIG welding is to me the easiest way for a novice to start welding on vehicles. And I have right here a MIG welder, which is an inverter type, and it's a full automatic. I have all the controls in the front and it's fully digitized so I can adjust the thickness of the steel. It will adjust for me automatically the wire speed, the amperage, everything. I can uh, set up the fill level. I can set up if it wants to do pulsed or not pulsed. I can select the gas. I can select the, the metal. So everything is kind of automated for you. So you don't have to worry too much about if you are not a professional welder. Of course, you can also change it back to a manual mode. Uh, but I like this kind of kit. It's very handy. Now, of course, this is not the cheapest model. This runs you about six, seven hundred euros or dollars, which is not too bad. But with make, you're also going to need a bottle of gas, very similar to what you had with the TIG. Now, in this case, I'm using 85% um, argon and 15% carbon dioxide. Uh, this is what I'm using on this one. But of course, you can use the same bottle as you had on your TIG if you wanted to. The main difference between a MIG and a TIG is that the MIG has the adding material inside the torch, whereby with the TIG, we had to add material to the melting puddle while we're going along. Now, that's not the case with a MIG. So that means that you have both your hands free, which is very handy because now you can really hold it like this and weld very solidly and very well controlled when you're welding. So that makes it a lot easier for the novice welder. I really enjoy it that way. So whenever we turn that on, you'll see when you pull the trigger, you will see this wire coming out. Uh, and the speed of that wire is regulated depending on the thickness you've set for the material you want to weld and the type of material. So that is the good thing about the fully automatic MIG welder. See how that comes out, this wire? And that wire is sitting inside on a reel and you can get it in different thicknesses, 0.6 mil or one mil, different sizes. 
I'm typically cut that off. The gas is also required to form a bubble around the welding area around the arc. And the gas is actually coming out out of these little holes here. So it's all coming through this one big tube here. So it's an all-in-one system, which makes it very handy. I think the most important part is if you're going to buy a MIG, is that you buy one with a removable front connector. Uh, that is important uh, because if it's a, if it's one that is fixed on it, you know, if, if it's worn out because it's going to worn out because there's wires running through it, uh, you have to toss it away. But with a removable uh, connector here, you can remove the torch. You can just get another torch and hook it up. So let's have a quick look inside the wire reel uh, where that sits. And inside you have the reel with the welding wire and you feed it through this mechanism and then it's fed all the way back to the torch and you can put different wheels on for different thicknesses. If you're going to buy a MIG welder, you've got to make sure that you know for what purpose you're going to use it. Because the features will determine the price. Now this specific one has a lot of features, uh, as you can see. I can adjust the thickness of the steel, that also adjusts then the speed of the wire. So everything I do here is fully automatic, so I don't need to worry too much about it. So right now, I'm set for welding at around 2.5 millimeter steel. And I even can decide the fill, how much fill I'm going to give it. See? So this is really good because I don't have to worry too much about this. Now, of course, this is not perfect, but it is a great help. It also tells me what kind of gas I have. And as you can see right now, I have argon and carbon dioxide in my gas bottle. So you can adjust that. And uh, my wire size is 0.8 right now. And then I can adjust all these different settings the way I need to set them. So now I place it fully on manual, but I don't want to go manual. I like it to have it all automatic. And that is the way we can get things sorted out. See, now I can weld metal, iron. I can weld um, copper. I can weld aluminum. You know, I can weld all kinds of things. And I, and I can also weld without gas when the wire is having a coating on it, which is called flux. Now I'm not going to do that. So let me just put that back to uh, my iron, so that's done. I can set the size of my wires, now it's set to 0.8, I can do 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 0 0.1. I can actually adjust my, my gas, carbon dioxide only, or argon and carbon dioxide. So these are all the options that we have on this. So really good, I also can get into menus for stitched welding and so on. So all by all, a lot of options on this device. It also changes the price. Uh, but then again, you might not need all this and what you need is something you will need to decide for yourself. So folks, welding is a lot of fun. And as a novice welder, I can only say exercise, exercise, test and trial will really help you out a lot. Now, MIG welding with a fully automatic MIG is very easy. You can get away with it very quickly and you will do fairly good welds with it from the start. It's going to cost you a little bit more money because of the automation of it. And if you get more experience, then you can move it to the manual mode. But of course, if you are an experienced welder, then you can go straight to a manual make if that's what you want. So it's all up to you and it all depends what you want to weld. If you're going to start welding aluminum, well, then buy a kit that can weld aluminum. If you weld only steel, then you might only want to buy one that can only weld steel. There's lots of YouTube movies on that, on how you should set it. Um, if you're going for a TIG, then I would say you're an artist, uh, because with a TIG you can make beautiful welds, uh, but it's going to take a long learning curve before you can make them. That's at least what I experienced, but it's doable, and I've used it before, so it's not that bad to do it. The arc welder or the traditional stick welder, well, I don't think that's suitable at all to work on your cars, um, or at least not for me. So overall, talking about cost, uh, and I think that's another important factor, I think you can get a decent TIG welder for around 150 to 200 dollars or euros. You should get a decent TIG welder with a few options, maybe after gas, uh, not pro gas, and you may not have all the options on it, but good enough to do steel work. Um, 
a good quality MIG welder or mid-range MIG welder, I should say, uh, with fully automatic modes like this one, it's going to run you between $600 and $800. Uh, I know it's a big difference, but it makes it so much better. And of course, then you still have to buy the gas and the uh, pressure regulators. Uh, the gas bottles typically is around 100 euros where I live. You have to buy them, but then you trade them in. And if you turn it all back and you stop welding totally, you get your money back for the bottle. A refill is not expensive. I use uh, 200 liter bottles and uh, the refill is, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's something like 30, 40 euros or dollars. So that's not too bad. So I hope all this information was a little bit useful to you. Um, I wanted to share it with you because I'm a novice welder and this is what I experienced over the years that I've been welding. And for sure, professional welders amongst you, they're probably going to have a laugh at this. But please, guys, uh, comment, correct me where I'm wrong or where I might be wrong and give us your advice because you guys are the experts. I'm just an ordinary user who wants to share some information. The first weld is a stick weld of two thick pieces of metal that we will weld back to back. And I'm using a 2.6 mil stick for that. So I'm going to set the arc welder or the MMA to about 80 amps. Typically 2.6 mil is good between 70 and 100. And let's see what it gives us. So now on the top you see the slack that's on it, so that you need to knock off. And that is the final weld. Now we're going to weld some thin panels with the MIG and this is about one mil. As you can see, this is a very, very fine weld. And for the middle part, I will increase the power a bit more. And you can see immediately the difference. With a bit more power, the weld is a lot better than we started off. This was not enough power. This is the right amount of power. Now the power on this device is settable by setting the thickness of the material on the dial on the MIG. The next trial is with the TIG and I want to make sure that my tungsten rod is really having a nice sharp tip. So once you got the puddle going, you can add the material. And it's a bit tough. So folks, this is it. We are done. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video and keep checking my channel because more is to come on Ultrasty very soon. Bye-bye.